Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Romans 12, verse 4. For as in one physical body we have many parts, organs, members, and all of these parts don't have the same function. <laughs> So we, numerous as we are, are one body in Christ the Messiah, and individually we are parts one of another, mutually dependent on one another, having gifts, faculties, talents, qualities that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. Now even within the same category of giftings, there will be different amounts of grace on different people. There are better singers than others. There are better speakers than others. There's always somebody that's going to be a little bit better at what you're doing than you are. I don't care how good you are, there's probably somebody that's got a little more grace. And what we don't have to do is be jealous of them or now think we have to do what they're doing. We need to find our sweet spot. Come on. Now, you know what? If we will stop trying to impress people, I said, if we will stop trying to impress people and compete with people and try to keep up with everybody else, God don't care about that stuff. The Bible says that he is not impressed with the positions that men hold. He's not impressed with our titles. Everybody thinks they got to have a title. You know, I started out, Joyce, and that's what I still am. People will say, shall we call you Dr. Meyer? Shall we call you Reverend Meyer? And you know, I, I don't, I mean, that's fine. I have a doctorate. Didn't go to school to get it, but you know, <laughs> I got it the better way. <laughs> I have like three or four now honorary degrees. I mean, I've got doctor of this and doctor of that and doctor of something else. I think it's kind of funny, don't you? I'm like, yeah, I'll take one of those grace doctorates. <laughs> so I, I can legally call myself Dr. Meyer. I could be reverend, bishop, apostle, well, you know, whatever. I don't know. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just Joyce. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not belittling those titles. They're titles of respect. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I'm trying to make the point that we get too caught up in titles. Everybody wants to be the boss. Well, what if you're not, don't have the grace to be the boss? You know, if you're trying to lead something and you're only anointed to follow, you're going to kill yourself. Now, let's talk about me and Dave for a minute because we have got a special case. <laughs> but we have got special grace. For this special case. I mean, really, it's very amazing because you don't see a situation like this very often. I'm the face, the name, I'm up here in front all the time. Dave waves at you from the corner over there, not because he is afraid to come out here. He speaks on Friday mornings about his passion for America. But that's not what he's called to do. It's not what he feels anointed to do. Sometimes I'll try to get him to come out. Matter of fact, I tried to get him to come up here this morning and share what I'm getting ready to share. And he said, no, you'll do a better job than me. Now, you know what? It takes a little bit of humility to look at somebody and say, you do that. You'll do a better job than me. Amen? And, but in the beginning, the devil tried his best to ruin this thing. And I remember when a pastor we had came to us, I was teaching a Bible study in our home, and he looked at Dave and he said, brother, you should be teaching that Bible study, not your wife. So we went home and tried it. <laughs> and here's the thing, Dave didn't have the grace and I didn't have the grace to keep quiet. <laughs> I know that's hard for you to believe, but that's the way it was. And Dave, in the beginning, this was a little hard for him. 
You know, because it's out of the ordinary. You know, when something's out of the ordinary, we just have a hard time wanting to embrace it. And, but it didn't take long, and he said, you know what, I, I know God's anointed you to do this, and I just want you to know that I'm for you. Now, Dave has a grace, just like I have a grace to do this part, Dave has a grace to do his part. And I can only remember a handful of times since I started teaching 37 years ago. Now listen to me, that Dave has not been right where he's at right now. And, and I tell him, I, I don't know how you can stand it. Because I would not have the grace to do that. I would be like, oh my God, not the same story again. I've heard this a thousand times. Can you please come up with something new to say? But, <laughs> but see, he's not like that at all. He think, I tell the same thing and he laughs every time. He thinks, and he said, he, he told me that, he said, it's not hard for me. He said, I really am interested. I really do think it's funny. He said, I sit there and I can sense what the people are getting out of this. So what Dave has done is he doesn't submit to me, he submits to the gift that God has put in me, and I submit to him as my husband. Because you know what? It's God's business where he puts what gifts. And how many more beautiful situations could we have in the world? Not necessarily one like this, but how many more beautiful situations could we have in the world if everybody would just find their sweet spot and stop trying to compete with other people? I mean, we have travel. We have people that travel with us that clean up. We have people that come and put all these wires around. I've got an administrative assistant. Mike Shepard, who's been helping me up here in the pulpit, he's been a pastor for 25, 30 years, and he could go and preach all over the place, but he has a gift. He says, my gift is to be number one at being number two. <laughs> Isn't that great? And that's awesome. He's not in, con he, he, if I want him to get up here and say something, I will. If I ask him to go back there and sweep the floor, he'd be happy to do that. Amen. Dave needed to get to the airport Monday morning. He has to leave real early, and so we asked Mike if he'd come at 6.15 in the morning and pick Dave up. Oh, yeah problem I'll be there I'll tell you what people like that are so valuable and then there's other people who devalue themselves because well I'm just a stay-at-home mom I just clean homes for people I'm only no you are a child of God and as long as you're doing the part that God has given you to do you are very valuable And I would imagine that there's some people sitting right here this morning and you think, you know what, I know right now that I'm trying to do something I don't have the grace to do. Anybody? <laughs> You're still like. <laughs> Verse 7, he whose gift is practical service, let him give himself to serving. He who, he who teaches to his teaching. And on and on and on it goes. We need to recognize the seasons in our life. Sometimes we're anointed for something and then there may come a time when God will say, now get out of the way and give that to somebody else. <laughs> That's not very comfortable, is it? You know, there's a time in your life when you're anointed to tell your children what to do all the time, but the time is going to come when you're going to have to release that and stop telling them what to do all the time. Just because you're somebody's parent doesn't mean you get to tell them what to do their whole entire life. Come on now. There's somebody here that needs to hear this. Romans 3, 23. I mean, John 3, 23. Oh, you guys just make me go in all kinds of directions I didn't intend to go in. Do you know you can pull stuff out of a teacher with your faith? That's why a lot of times I end up saying a bunch of stuff I didn't plan to say, and what I plan to say is still on the paper. <laughs> All right, now quickly, John the Baptist was a great man of God, had a powerful reputation, and he, he baptized people all the time under repentance. And um, 
In John 3, 23, it says, but John also was baptizing at Aenon near Salim, for there was an abundance of water there, and the people kept coming to him and being baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore, <laughs> there arose a controversy between some of John's disciples and a Jew in regard to purification. And he came to John and reported to him, Rabbi, the man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one to whom you have borne testimony, now he is baptizing and everybody's flocking to him. So now he's talking about Jesus. He's like, look, buddy, you're about to lose your crowd. <laughs> you, <laughs> you got a little competition over here on the other side of town. You think this nonsense don't go on among preachers? Sure it does. Well, how big was your meeting? Well, how many did you have? Who did you have? You know, several years ago, God commanded me to stop counting things. I mean, I can remember for years, as soon as we'd get out of these meetings, well, how many people were there? I don't ever ask that anymore. <laughs> we don't, we don't, that's not what we need to be doing. We need to have the same heart no matter how many are there. And we don't have to be in competition all the time. I'm not saying that counting something is wrong, but I had just, it's just not what I needed to be doing. So, John answered, I want you to see this because this is going to be good for you. Verse 27, John answered, a man can receive nothing, he can claim nothing, he can take unto himself nothing, except that it has been granted to him from heaven. A man must be content to receive the gift which is given him from heaven. There is no other source. Now, can I tell you something? I, I'm a really good Bible teacher, and I am a good leader, but I would make a lousy pastor. You say, well, I kind of feel like you're my pastor. Well, you know what? I may be your teacher, but you wouldn't want me for counseling. <laughs> Not unless you wanted to get your problem fixed really quick. But here's the funny thing. Do you know when I first started in ministry, I counseled people all the time and loved it. Now, the very thoughts of it. Every once in a while, somebody will ask me to do it for them as a favor for a friend, and I'm like, you just going to be better off if you get somebody else. <laughs> so that grace that I once had to do that, I don't have anymore. And see, it got real quiet when I said I'd make a lousy pastor. Well, we need to be able to say what we are not good at and what we are good at. There's no shame in saying I'm not good at that. Everybody wants to think they're a great leader, but not everybody is a great leader. Not everybody is a great organizer. Not everybody is a great motivator of people. We need to find our sweet spot and stay in it. Some can be leaders of five, some 10, some 50, some 100. Some can lead a local church. Some can go to a state, some to a nation, some to the world. Not everybody can do the same thing. And we need to stop looking at other people trying to be what they are and finally get into what we have grace for and stay there. You know, we're only going to go through here once in life, and we need to enjoy it. So then if you go on down here, John actually said about Jesus, he must increase, and now I must decrease. Wow. See, I've had to turn things over that I used to do all the time. And it's amazing. You know, I, I look at, they'll take one of my teachings now and change the name of it. Because they think that what they've got, and I'm like, I never taught that. <laughs> oh, yeah, you did? I said, well, I didn't call it that. Well, we thought this would be better. And in the beginning, I'd get my back up a little bit. Well, don't mess with my teeth. You know? Well, why have a marketing department if you're not going to let them market? <laughs> Hello? Why have a media department if I'm not going to let them media? <laughs> See, I don't need to go in and throw my weight around and demand that everything be done my way just because I could if I wanted to. There's a difference in a boss and a leader. Amen. 
And a lot of people don't really want to be leaders. They want to be a boss. There's two ways that you can live. You can live by your own power or by the power of God. Galatians chapter 4, verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondmaid and one by the free woman. But whereas the child of the slave woman was born according to the flesh and had an ordinary birth, the son of the free woman was born in fulfillment of the promise. Now, if you know very much about the Bible, and there may be some people here today who don't, and so that's okay. Abraham had no children. Abraham and Sarah. Actually, their names then were Abram and Sarai. God changed their names to Abraham and Sarah because the meaning of names was a lot more pertinent then than it is to us today. And he had no children, and he wanted a child of his own. He said, I have no heir. And so God promised him that he would give him a child from his own body. However, there was a problem. <laughs> Abraham was somewhere around 100 and Sarah was about 90 and just to be very plain she had had the change of life and he was impotent <laughs> no natural way that they could get a baby <laughs> and God said you will have a child of your own flesh well many years went by and it didn't happen and this is where we have problems, isn't it? God gives us a promise, a promise, and then a lot of years go by and nothing happens. So we come up with our own plan. <gasps> I know how God must want to do this. I wish I had time to take you all these places. You can look in Genesis 15. and, and Gen Matter of fact, let's just go there for a second. I've got time. Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your abundant compensation, and your reward shall be exceedingly great. And Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me since I'm going from this world childless? And he who shall be the owner and the heir of my house is the servant, Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram continued, Look, you've given me no child, and, and a servant born in my house is going to be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man shall not be your heir, but he who shall come from your own body shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and showed him the stars, and he said, Your descendants will be as many as these stars. And here was Abram's response. And Abram believed God, and it was counted unto him as right standing with God. The only response that God wants us to ever have to his promises is, I believe. I believe. And don't let your mind faint when you begin to look at the impossibility of your circumstances. It was impossible in the natural for them to have a child. It was not possible but what is possible with not possible with man is possible with God and we all know that in different ways but I know that every time I stand I mean I, I sat back over there and looked this morning all these beautiful people here and I thought this is just not possible why would these people keep coming to hear me speak. You know why? Because with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. So Abram just believed God. You know, we, we instead of saying, why God, why, when God, when, how are you going to do that? Just start saying, I believe. Now, Genesis 16, verse 1. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had not borne him any children. A lot of years had gone by, still no kitties. So she got a bright idea. But she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar, and Sarah said to Abram, See here now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children, so now I'm going to ask you to have intercourse with my maid, and it may be that I can obtain children by her. And Abram listened to and heeded what Sarah said. Not a good time to listen to your wife. How many of you know that even a half-bright woman doesn't give her husband another woman? Yeah. 
So, I mean, this is just such a cool story if you read it all. So, you know, he took her and she got pregnant and she had a baby and then she started mocking Sarah. Ha ha, I'm pregnant and you're not. Or however that went. Verse 4, and so he had intercourse with Hagar, and she became pregnant. And when she saw that she was with child, she looked with contempt upon her mistress and despised her. Then Sarah said to Abram, and I love this. May the responsibility for my wrong or the deprivation of my rights be upon you. <laughs> Come on, have you ever made a mess? Have you ever get into works of the flesh, made a big mess, and then blame it on somebody else? Long story short. She gave birth to Ishmael. His name meant man of war. <laughs> Come on, we got a fast track here. When you get into your own works, it's always going to be war, 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 war. <laughs> but ultimately, God did fulfill his promise. I think it probably took longer maybe than it would have if they would have just stayed away from Ishmael. And she gave birth into the child of promise. Name is Isaac, and Isaac's name means laughter. <laughs> if you want to enjoy the journey, then you have to wait for the promises of God. Stay away from works of the flesh, because if you want to have laughter and joy, you need to learn how to sit back and watch God work in your life through His grace. If you want to have war all the time, then just go ahead and do it yourself. Amen? I am so enjoying what I'm doing. I mean, I love, I mean, yes, I get tired physically, but when, I, when I'm doing what I'm doing right now, I am in my element. This is my sweet spot in life. And we're hitting home runs today. And so although my physical flesh is tired, I've done this thousands of times. I know what I got to do to regenerate and revive. I got two days to get ready for television on Tuesday and Wednesday. So I know what I'm going to do to build back up. But inside right now, I feel so alive. I feel so full of zeal. I feel so full of passion. You know why? Because we're hitting home runs today. People are being set free. Bondages are being broken. You're going to enjoy God more than ever before, and you can actually enjoy your life. All you got to do is get out of the way and let God be God. Can anybody just get out of the way and let God be God? Amen? It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. There's two ways that we can live. We can live by our own power or by the power of God. You know, the choice is really ours. God is standing by waiting to help us. All we need to do is ask. You know, God has made His grace available to us. His grace is powerful. It enables us. It helps us. It forgives us. And not only do we have grace available, we have grace, grace, and more grace available. So often in the church world, we hear a lot about the grace of God, but I wonder if we really understand how valuable and how amazing grace is and how much of it there is for us that we probably never tap into. Let's don't just talk about grace. Let's really learn what it is and make sure that we access it in every area of our life. wondering lately, what is it that makes a person want to leave the comfort and monotony of home to come someplace crazy like this and do a medical clinic? Well, let's ask the volunteer doctors and nurses who do it all the time. They look sad and get downhearted and then they look at you get make eye contact. 
and you smile, and they read that smile, and then they start smiling, and then the kids all run to you and they smile. When you really experience that, you just, you would, you're hooked. <laughs> So what do you think? It can't hurt to at least check it out, right? All you need to do is go to our website, JoyceMeyer.org. All the information is there for you. And just think, your adventure may begin today.